Good evening. <laughs> Shall we start with a prayer invoking the presence of God and the Great Ones? Beloved God, beloved Gurus, help us to intuit your nearness with us this evening and with us, loving us, guiding us every day of our lives. Om. Amen. I wanted to mention just a couple of things as a little update. You know, it's the first century of Master's work in the world, in the West, and um, we now have members in over 175 countries. Some of these are very small islands, some are areas where there's just a tiny handful of devotees, but it's already spread around the world. Very few countries where no one has heard of Paramahansa Yogananda and the truth that has made such a difference in our lives. And I think we just have to gently build on that and build on that and build on that. You know, he said the blueprint is in the ether. I think it's more than in the ether now. It's imprinted around the world. And we will build on that until these teachings are available everywhere they're needed. So many of you have come, especially in recent years, to help with this huge and beautiful work. And I work with a number of the beautiful souls who've come. And it's the same spirit of master, isn't it, in householder and in renunciant. You just look into people's eyes and you see a love for God, a love for gurus, a love for their world family that transcends love of self or any self-interest. And sometimes I wonder how I got to be so lucky as to be part of this. And perhaps many of us feel that. But we are, so we'll take it. I wanted to say something else about the future of SRF. Last year, I had the privilege to serve at one of the events at the girls' youth camp. And after going to the altar and kneeling in front of the gurus, the girls would then come, just walk over to me just a few steps. So I was seeing their faces, their expressions, just after they offered themselves to God, to gurus. And I wanted to say to you that if children like this, such souls, if they represent the future of SRF and the future of the world, I think we have less to worry about than we thought. They radiated such purity and yet such depth gentle spiritual strength because in those moments they knew that they belonged first to God and they knew they were connected with him. So that to me is through the view for the next century. And those of you who are parents, those of you who serve in our youth programs, just keep on with what you're doing. Help them to keep God real help them to attend the special functions for young people, help them to keep in touch with SRF friends if they live where there aren't many members, and teach them to give as well as to receive through the prayer circle and in other ways. And thank you all, you who serve in so many ways, and those who just pray, and that's sometimes the greatest support of all. Together, we are helping to create the better world that we all dreamed of. We're not just dreaming anymore, we're making it happen. Our subject tonight is spiritually balancing life. You all must be deep seekers or you wouldn't be spending your vacation by coming to convocation. And I think that each one of you could probably come up with a very effective list of what it takes to live a spiritually balanced life. 
Perhaps the principal need this evening is to review what Guruji said and to encourage each other so that we never, ever give up our search for God. The Bible says that those who seek, find. We all go back to God when we determine to do so. Master said man's freedom is final and immediate. If he so wills, it depends not on outer but inner victories. And he also said men and women, one by one, escape from creation's prison of duality as they awaken to consciousness of their inseverable divine unity with the Creator. And how do you awaken to that inseverable divine unity? By meditation, by Kriya meditation. So regular meditation will always be primary among the SRF requirements for a balanced and successful life. Master never spoke of the essentials without stressing meditation. He said once, everything my guru told me, I put into practice. As a result, I have kept my priorities straight. Then he said, I never miss three things, meditation, morning and evening, exercises and service to others, and he said, everything else somehow gets done. Meditation, morning and evening. Exercises, service to others. A spiritually balanced life really means to put God first, doesn't it? And if we do that, as many of you here have experienced, everything else falls into place. For example, if we have a problem, whatever it is, we can let it come between us and God, between us and Guru. If we do that, we're immediately weakened just when we need to be strongest, because that weakens our contact with them, the source of the help we need to overcome. If, on the other hand, we allow problems to drive us closer to God, if we immediately acknowledge I probably can't succeed, can't overcome without his help. Then we do pray, we don't stop meditating or meditate less. We go to those with the real power to help us. Master said that life on this earth is a school and he gave a number of lectures on that subject. We have to learn the lessons that come to us or the alternative is we repeat the course, that is, we reincarnate and face the same challenges again and again and again. Do you ever feel just a little bored with all of it, as though we've done it before? <laughs> we must get it right this time. Just as in any course of study, you go to the teacher, the professor, for help with some difficult aspect. So we have to go to God and Guru, our spiritual teachers, for help, guidance with all our problems. They have the solutions. That way all experiences, positive or even the seemingly negative, can be in some way constructive for us. We can't always control what happens in life but we always have choice how we will react. And when we let everything just drive us closer to God, we share the joy with Him, we get His help with problems, then we gradually become more united to Him. As we become more united to God, we become freer of whatever it was or is that is causing us to reincarnate. In his Gita interpretations, Guruji says, all unbalanced states are obstacles to the yogi. Balance is essential in every phase of life. He stresses a balanced and moderate diet, neither overeating nor undereating, 
because both extremes are detrimental to health. You give the body its needs, neither pampering nor abusing. There's no value in either extreme. Even sleep, oversleep or too little sleep, both are to be avoided by the yogi. Balance is what is needed, giving the body its need. Shri Yukta what you said, throw the dog a bone, give the body what it needs to function as you need it to function. And his sadhana is suitable for both householder and renunciant seeking freedom in God because it includes this balance, this beautiful balance of regular meditation, of service to others, to God in others, rest, recreation, and exercise, everything in moderation. Guruji explains in the Gita interpretations that until the yogi is very advanced, he cannot remain constantly in the higher states of consciousness. So constructive activity is very, very useful. This way we gradually work out remaining karma and we also gradually learn to hold on to the spiritual states, the awareness of God, in activity as well as in meditation. Master promises, he who in a balanced way tries to be both human and divine comes to the point where he experiences equal joy, whether in the state of human activity or deep meditation. He who in a balanced way tries to be both human and divine comes to the point where he experiences equal joy, whether in the state of human activity or deep meditation. This perhaps explains why we all feel happier on occasions like this when we spend the week at convocation or deeply engrossed in our spiritual pursuits, living such an ideal, balanced life, meditating, willing service to others, very moderate use of the senses. This way the joy can become unbroken. But balance isn't always easy to achieve and to maintain. One of the members of our board of directors, Uma Mata, I was uh, reporting to her some years ago. I hadn't quite fulfilled all of my responsibilities and I was telling her why I had failed in some things and then also what I was primarily working with. And she wrote me a very beautiful letter in response. And part of it was, while you are trying to accomplish all the things you listed, please try to be balanced. Get sufficient rest, otherwise you won't accomplish anything. She went on to say, I know you're doing your best, and that is all God and Master expect of us. Years ago, I had read a, a quote, medical science has yet to discover a tranquilizer more effective than a few kind words. It's true, isn't it? And these few kind words, I know you're doing your best, and that is all God and Guru expect. They have been a tranquilizer to me many, many times, and they have really helped to balance my life. So I offer them to you in that spirit. All they ever ask of us is that we sincerely try. God and Guru know the circumstances of our lives actually even better than we do. And all they ever ask is that we try, we do the best we can, we don't give up. Guruji has left with us a number of very wonderful examples of spiritually balanced living. And one peerless one is Sri Dayamata. I've never met anyone so happy, happy all the time, so secure, so fulfilled, deeply, deeply fulfilled. She's never not fulfilled. She's never not secure. She's never not happy, so giving to all because she comes from that point of perfection. 
Well, that's what it's like to know God. The pursuit we're on is a very worthwhile one. That's what it's like to have God. That is the result of a very balanced life, putting God first. Her life as both spiritual leader and secular leader, you know, it's a worldwide religion and a worldwide organization. Her job isn't simple by anyone's standards. But whenever you see her, she always has her priorities straight. You never get the feeling that she feels just compelled to do something and would rather be doing something else. You always feel from her total concentration and total caring. Everything she does, she does with love for God and Guru, for God in others. With her, this is total now. There's nothing on earth that can prevent us from following her example if we choose to do so. And to whatever extent we do follow that example, we also risk being stuck with even greater happiness, a happiness that never grows stale, and an inner security that nothing can disturb and the sort of fulfillment that Diamata radiates. She said once, there is but one desire in my soul for you, to see you all bathed in that divine consciousness. Her words and her actions, they're like everlasting lamps which light the way for us from wherever we happen to be at the moment all the way to the goal because she sees the goal. My mother met Diamata in the late 60s on one of Ma's trips to Europe. And after that meeting, she wrote to me, if you gain even a little of the joy that lady radiates, you will be one of the most fortunate on earth. I kept that quote because I thought, well, it was a brief talk they had, but she recognized something about Ma. It's so easy for us to think, but Ma came on earth a saint. And then we can use that as an excuse. But really, is it relevant? Isn't the real truth that Master gave her to us as a guide, as an example? We hear so much of her actions, we see her on occasion, we have her beautiful words in her books, and her letters telling us how she has lived, how she has coped. Why not follow, since we're sure that she knows the way? Master drew disciples to himself to make them victorious, to make them free. He takes a portion of our karma, and we know much is removed by the grace of God. But there is some activity, some striving that we need we must fulfill in order to become strong spiritually and to be able to sustain eventually the full spiritual victory and freedom of God consciousness. So we should face each day with courage. Think of Ma's example. God and Guru love us as much as they love her and they will help us as they helped her. And they will free us all eventually as they have freed her. A very sincere devotee was going through a little period of testing, sort of having some doubts about herself. And she wondered if in some way she was missing the point she had the opportunity to ask Diamata. Well, Ma knew that she was a very faithful and loyal devotee, meditated regularly and so on. Ma asked her, Three questions. Do you try to be kind to all? Yes. Do you try to be compassionate? Yes. Do you try to reach out to others? Yes. And Ma said, then you have nothing to worry about. Be kind, try to be kind. Doesn't matter if everyone always feels that we're being kind enough, but we're trying to be kind. Try to be compassionate, try to reach out to others. And Ma said, you have nothing to worry about. 
I think President Lincoln was credited with the quote, you can please all of the people some of the time, some of the people all of the time, but not all of the people all of the time. Probably by now we've all realized that this is true because it seems that not even God or the God-realized gurus are able to please everybody all of the time. I think most of us enjoy constructive activity. We're glad to serve. It's very nice to think, perhaps sometimes we've helped others, that we might even leave this world a little better than we found it. But sometimes we do our best and still others are displeased with us. Then how are we supposed to behave? What is our responsibility? What would be a balanced response? when others are displeased with us. Dayama's guidance, based on her guru's training for those 20 odd years, if you can help a situation by doing or saying something, by all means do it. But if after sincerely trying the problem remains, then, she says, just pray and send love and keep on praying and sending love. Often that will produce miraculous or near miraculous results, the prayer if the action hasn't. But if it doesn't, she has said, be willing and care enough to keep on praying, to keep on sending love to the end of life if necessary. And when should we pray? Whenever the thought of the problem enters the mind. Don't worry, because that's a waste of time. Don't become obsessed with a problem, because that doesn't solve it. But pray and send love every time it comes to mind. And when this method doesn't have a miraculous effect, at the very least, it lifts the one who is praying above the problem. And you can imagine if two people are having difficulties, if they both prayed in this completely sincere way and sent thoughts of love back and forth, both would be lifted up, and where would the problem be? It's one of those things, if we will have the patience, the perseverance to practice it, it works. It always works. Another absolute essential for successful, balanced living is forgiveness. Probably many of you know the story in the Bible. Peter was apparently frustrated by someone and he asked Jesus how many times was he expected to forgive his brother? Seven times enough? And the surprising answer was no. It sounds like a lot, doesn't it? You know, he did this, he did this, 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 this and I'm still forgiving him. <laughs> and Jesus told him 70 times seven times. I did the arithmetic, it's 490 times. <laughs> Who's gonna keep count that long? <laughs> Even with a computer. Maybe the point is that forgiveness is supposed to become a habit Let it become unconditional. You know, it's so easy when we're just dealing with the circumstances of one day, the disappointments and so on, the stresses, to think, do we really owe anyone that much forgiveness? But on the other hand, we willingly hand over 25% of our bad karma to our guru, and we're delighted that another... <laughs> Has anyone turned down the offer? I haven't. <laughs> I accepted it too. <laughs> and we're delighted if another 50% is removed by the grace of God. And just think how much forgiveness that represents. It's probably more than 490 incidents, isn't it? Ma, as with so many other spiritual qualities, 
excels also in her capacity for forgiveness. She had an opportunity to visit, during the last illness, someone who had spoken against her and against her guru's work. And she went, of course, and one who was present told me that she just sat and held the devotee's hand and gently touched the spiritual eye and told him that God loved him. It's very helpful when people are coming to the end of life if you just gently touch them there to stroke them because you want them to concentrate there. It eases the passing. When someone's in a very weak condition, they may not have all their willpower, they may not have enough uh, concentration going. And if you do this sometimes, it's very helpful. It draws the attention there. So that's what she was doing, telling him God loved him. Because her forgiveness is like Christ's. It is immediate and it is total. When you think about it, how could such a soul not be free? So when we forgive, we may free the other person, but aren't we also freeing ourselves? And this is why it's so important to successful and balanced spiritual living. Study is something else that has a deeper value than is at first apparent. We all want to read Guruji's words and learn and understand and put them into practice. And this is right and good. But something else happens when we study, because we're reading the words of an avatar, and they are permeated with his divine consciousness. As we open ourselves to his thoughts and his way of looking at things, we're uplifted automatically. We're making his thoughts our thoughts. We're pulled up closer to that divine state of consciousness. So every day, and whenever anything in this world gets too real, just bathe your consciousness in his thoughts, in his outlook. It isn't just reading, it isn't just study. It's bathing to the extent that we're able to, that we're receptive in his consciousness. This is why over the centuries the words of Jesus, Krishna, Buddha, have retained their power to guide and to help and to free men and women around the world. And now we have so much detail. I think sometimes we have so much detail in Master's writings that it almost makes us slightly undervalue one, one book or one page or one quote. And yet one saint in India told a devotee on this path, just take one thought, your guru is so great, just take one thought, you'll get there. Live that thought. And some do it, and they get there. Another thing I think we can't survive without on the spiritual path is a sense of humor. I think you all have that. <laughs> in one of the offices at Mount Washington, they put jokes on the board sometimes. Mostly because when you go there, it's very businesslike and you often have to wait. So they have a little bulletin board of jokes and one there that was very interesting. Well, the purpose of their joke board is partly in our dedication. It's a reminder not to take ourselves too seriously. The first picture, the devotee is praying very devoutly, Lord, slay mine enemies. Sorry if you've heard it before, but I think it's worth repeating. The second picture, nothing happens, there's no response. The third picture, devoutly praying again, at least destroy my worst enemy. <laughs> and then the fourth picture, there's a tremendous zap coming down. <laughs> <laughs> Annihilation. <laughs> Worst enemy was destroyed. <laughs> we all know, don't we, when we're being our own worst enemies. And it's in attitude, isn't it? But there is an antidote. Remember always, we are the children of God. 
we can and we will know him when we put him first all the time. And when we find our true home in him, everything we've ever desired and more will come to us. There is no craving that isn't more than fulfilled in God. There's no ache left, there's no emptiness. So, let us try not to be <laughs> too often our own worst enemies. <laughs> Another essential, of course, is prayer. No spiritual life can really be alive without prayer, which is talking to God. This is not something formal, a formal address. It's not something you put in the computer and edit. Mara always says it comes from the heart. You pour out from there to your divine father, your divine mother, your divine friend, your divine beloved, whatever you feel. And if sometimes if there are things that perhaps we couldn't express to another human being, maybe there are even things we're not proud of, we can say anything to God. I think one of our most sacred responsibilities is to pray for others, to pray for the world, because in these teachings we have so much. We already have so much security, so much freedom, comparatively speaking. And there are so many that don't have it. We're definitely in an ascending era, but there's still much to do. Because I live at Mount Washington, I am surrounded by a lot of good. And sometimes I think I can forget the way it is in some parts of the world. So to remind me always of the inequalities, I keep two pictures by my altar. First one is of a very beautiful little child, very, very healthy, shining, clean hair. And she's kneeling in front of a very cute but very ugly baby rhino. And it's obvious they know each other well, and the child is holding the rhino's face in her hands like this, very gently, very lovingly. The rhino has his head down, very still, eyes are half closed obviously loving the touch, this gentle touch of this child, and sort of soaking it in. And the other picture is also of a child and an animal. And this is of a starved youngster with stick-like limbs, but the limbs have collapsed and the child has fallen forward, so the forehead is resting on the ground. It's just dirt. There's not enough strength anymore to be upright. He or she is so thin. You can't see if it's a boy or a girl. Just a little soul in there. There's nothing else in the picture except the animal. And in this case, the animal is a vulture. And it's perched a few feet away, waiting for the child to die. When I first saw that picture, I thought, well, it's had its effect on me. It makes me want to cut it out, keep it, and remember to pray, so that I pray daily for people who are in this kind of need. To me, these pictures represent heaven and hell. God gave us this beautiful world to be another heaven, and for some it is that, but it's not yet for all. So these pictures remind me never to stop praying until every child and every person has the life represented by the first picture, and the second picture is just a dream. We're all members of the SRF Prayer Council, and I don't think there's any more important duty than our participation in those daily prayers. Members and friends and others around the world rely on our prayers, giving this help and support it is a God-given opportunity to do good, and I think it's a responsibility and a major part of a spiritually balanced life. When families seek God together and live spiritually balanced lives together, beautiful things happen. In one SRF family, there's a little girl of about five, and the parents were about to celebrate a wedding anniversary. So she wanted to write a letter to them. But she was just learning to write herself, so she had to call on one of her older brothers to help her with a penmanship. But she got her thoughts down on paper. 
Her letter said that every day she prayed for her parents three times a day. Now she's five. To make it clear she didn't forget while at school, she explained that she took time always during the lunch hour to do this. And then lest they think that she might have sort of taken it easier on the weekends, she also explained that on Saturdays and Sundays, she also, whatever they were doing, three times each day, she prayed for her mummy, her daddy. Can you imagine receiving such a gift? Such a pure, beautiful child, you know? We're all made in God's image. Each one of you, each one of us, if we were the Heavenly Father, if we were the Divine Mother, how would you respond to such prayers so regularly, so beautifully, from such a tiny child, hardly more than a baby? Where would you get purer prayers, purer love? This type of heaven on earth is being created, even now, in countless families. We think so often in terms of the parents praying for the children, and that's right, of course. But SRF is drawing a lot of strong, pure souls who give spiritually from a very early age. This letter will no doubt be preserved as a precious family heirloom, but being written on paper, it will eventually fade and crumble. But I wonder how long the effects of those prayers three times every day will last and what they will achieve. To the parents of this little girl, I would say, we'd all like to have your karma, but you deserved it, <laughs> obviously. Master tells us so many times that life is really a dream and the reality lies beyond. It's hard to remember this all the time, especially when people are suffering. Master wrote once to a bereaved mother, her only son was killed in a road accident, and she was inconsolable, which is very understandable. First of all, he told her her son had not suffered, it had been very quick, and that he was in a fine place and was going ahead, and she should send him love, thoughts of love, and they would meet again. And then he told her, be patient with yourself, give yourself time to recover. And then he went on and said, this won't help you right now, what I'm going to tell you now, but keep the letter, it will help you later. And he told her that on three occasions, he had been so driven, so overwhelmed by the suffering of men and women, children on earth, that like the Lord Buddha, he sat and prayed, determined not to move until he received some answer, some explanation, some justification of all that suffering. And he said that on each occasion, when the divine response came, it was the same. I created all this for your entertainment. You insist on taking it seriously. But even Master, even an avatar, wasn't enough that he heard that once. On three different occasions throughout his life, he just railed against what was happening in creation. And each time the response was the same. And he said to this mother, that is the truth, that is the ultimate truth. Do you remember on the video, Glimpses of a Life Divine, Sri Manlini Mata talks about him laughing. He was saying, it's such a joke, it's such a joke. And then he was looking at the disciples and he got tears in his eyes when he said, but to you, it is yet real. We have forgotten that we are immortal. A part of spirit and eternal. Eventually we will see all of life's experiences as dreams, but until we get that permanent realization, we must remember to hold on to what Master says about the dream nature of the world. Every time you go into deep, very deep sleep or into very deep meditation, you're lifted above the dream nature of the world into reality. 
but remember that so that we're not overwhelmed by what happens on this plane. Whoever we have lost, we will find again. Whatever the desire or need that we may experience, it will be more than satisfied in the ever new joy and fulfillment of divine union. So to summarize, never give up meditation. Put God first and you will know him. That's what Diamata did. And service, whatever your job is, whatever your work is, do it to serve. Do it to serve God in others. Moderation in use of the senses and a balanced life with sufficient rest, exercise, recreation. Keep a sense of humor. Save jokes if you have to. Do anything that works. Remember forgiveness. Be kind to all. And pray. Lose the thought of self in praying to bring more good into the lives of others. And then if anything interrupts your perfect spiritual routine, deal with it and then go on. Do you remember with the first disciples, often Master would say, you must do this regularly, and he would make it impossible for them to do whatever that was. Absolutely impossible. But what he was watching for was what happened the very first morning or evening or time. It wasn't impossible. Had they remembered, would they go back to it? Would they do everything that he said? Because he said he did everything that his guru said. And that is how he became free. And he wanted them to pay as much attention as he had paid to his own guru and likewise become free. Just to close with some of Master's optimism. Ask God to be with you. Learn to love God as the joy felt in meditation. And I would add also after meditation. He says, then victory is near. Ask God to be with you. Learn to love God as the joy felt in meditation. Then victory is near. Have only two ambitions, to know God and to play your part on earth as his perfect child. If you know God, you will play your part well, and vice versa. If you play your part well, you will know God. Then he said, if you are sincere, you shall know God in this life. And to know him is to be free. If you are sincere, you shall know God in this life. And to know him is to be free. Thank you. God bless you. Jai Guru.